Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and we are back for part three of my series on uh, nuclear physics and nuclear weapons. In the previous episode, we talked about gun-type weapons. This time, we are going to talk about the more complicated uh, implosion-type weapons. Now, we've previously discussed the Little Boy, which used uranium as its power source. However, the Manhattan Project also decided, at a very early, very early time, to investigate plutonium weapons. Now, uh, this was back when the only samples of plutonium they had were microscopic samples that had been generated in particle accelerators. But in part, this was them hedging their bets in case uh, enriching uranium to weapons grade proved to have some sort of insurmountable obstacle. Uh, plutonium could be made in reactors and separated chemically, which of course represented a completely different set of technical hurdles, which uh, of course had their own chance of success or failure. I'll go into more details on the production in a later video. So the Manhattan Project set about designing a second weapon. The Thin Man was another gun-type device, like the Little Boy, but using plutonium-239 as its fissile material. The name Thin Man came from the much longer gun barrel that was used to assemble the fissile core. The barrel had to be longer to increase the speed of the projectile. If you remember my description of the Little Boy, you'll remember that there was a 10% chance that the chain reaction would start before the core was fully inserted, resulting in a premature detonation with a much lower yield. The problem with the Thin Man was that the plutonium-239 had a much higher rate of spontaneous fission and therefore higher background neutron radiation, and so the insertion of the critical mass had to happen even faster to ensure the weapon didn't pre-detonate. Scientists calculated that the slug would have to be accelerated to about 900 meters per second. To achieve these velocities, the Thin Man weapon was over 5 meters long to accommodate its long gun barrel. It was so long, in fact, that the only aircraft in the Allied Armed Forces that could carry this was the Avril Lancaster. Now, testing of dummy models did show issues with aerodynamics, but the real problem was when they finally started getting samples of plutonium produced in reactors delivered for testing. Now, the early the device had been designed around plutonium that had been produced in cyclotrons, but the reactor produced plutonium had a lot more of the isotope plutonium-240, and that had an even higher rate of spontaneous fission, increasing the amount of background neutrons produced. So that meant that to minimize the chance of pre-detonation with the plutonium that they were going to use, would require an even longer gun barrel. In fact, the gun barrel would have been so long it couldn't fit any aircraft that was flying or even on the drawing board. So in July of 1944, development of the Thin Man was stopped and all plutonium weapon research was refocused on the development of an implosion device nicknamed the Gadget. The gadget would become the first nuclear weapon ever tested and ultimately would be used under the name Fat Man. An implosion type device uses shaped explosives to compress fissile material, raising the density until it reaches a critical state and is able to support a chain reaction. The advantage over a gun type device is that the distances involved are very, very short. So the time between the onset of criticality and peak criticality are much, much shorter, typically of the order of a few microseconds, reducing the window in which a pre-detonation fizzle is a risk. The first plutonium bombs used just over 6 kilograms of plutonium in a 9 centimeter sphere. This is generally referred to as the pit. Now, during detonation, this is compressed to more than double its regular density, and uh, that reduces the critical mass and that causes it to explode. This is why the gadget was able to get away with less than one-tenth the amount of fissile material required by the little boy. To make an implosion weapon work, one of the biggest problems that had to be solved was generating an explosion which would then compress the pit reliably. 
The gadget used 32 blocks of explosives arranged into a sphere in a mathematical form called a truncated isosahedron pattern, which many of you might recognize as the pattern of pentagons and hexagons that make up the surface of some soccer balls. Now, each of these blocks had a single detonator, and all 32 detonators were synchronized to fire within about 10 nanoseconds of each other. The synchronization constraints required development of many new technologies, such as exploding bridge wire detonators connected to high power electrical pulse generators. The whole box was known as the X unit, and it was 180 kilograms of cutting edge 1940s electronics. Now, it's easy to imagine that all these explosions would converge and squeeze the pit down, but it's not as simple as that. It never is. In high explosives, the detonation kind of travels through the explosive as a supersonic shockwave sustained by the chemical energy released, right? Now, initially, this forms a spherical detonation front radiating away from the detonation point. When two separate spherical waves collide, it creates an, an even higher pressure boundary layer, which causes jets of material that goes even faster. And the whole shock wave actually becomes spiky. And instead of compressing it, this will actually tend to tear the core apart. To create a clean, spherically symmetrical implosion requires reversing the curvature of the diverging detonation waves and turning them into converging waves. And this is done using explosive lenses. Now, just as, an explo as a regular optical lens bends light because the speed of light inside glass is lower than the speed of light inside air, an explosive lens can work because different explosive compounds will have different detonation speeds. The initial detonation would occur inside fast explosive, and then the detonation front would encounter a curved lens made of slower explosive. The fast explosive used in the gadget was something called Composition B. It was a 60% cyclonite, 40% TNT, and it produced a detonation wave of about 7,920 meters per second. The slow wave, explo slow explosive used was called Baritol. That's a 76% barium nitrate, about 24% TNT. And the velocity of that explosive was about 4,870 meters per second. Finally, after the uh, correct curvature had been produced, there was a second layer of fast explosive that would provide even more energy and push it in towards the middle. In total, the explosive layer was about 45 centimeters thick and massed about two and a half tons. Though the converging shock wave would then hit a 12 centimeter thick layer of aluminium. This was the pusher sphere. What this kind of did was it smoothed out the explosive shock front to help transfer the force more cleanly to the inner layers. And there is a huge amount of detail that I am leaving out here because shock dynamics are incredibly complex and worth videos all of their own. Then there was a thin boron plastic neutron shield surrounding six and a half centimeters of natural unenriched uranium tamper that encased the plutonium pit. Again, the tamper's job was to hold the core together for but a moment longer and to reflect neutrons back into the pit and reduce its critical mass. However, unlike the tungsten carbide tamper in the little boy, the uranium tamper could actually participate in the reaction. If you look at the high end of the neutron energy graph for the uranium-238 that I showed in episode one, you'll see that above about one mega electron volt, the probability of fission suddenly shoots up and becomes much more dominant over absorption. That's because the extra energy required to push the nucleus into an unstable territory it comes from those incoming neutrons. So, some high energy neutrons from plutonium fission could trigger fission within the uranium-238. Even though uranium-238 can't itself sustain a nuclear chain reaction, it could generate extra energy. And in the fat man, you would get about 20% extra energy just from this uranium tamper surrounding the pit. 
Now the detonation pressure of Composition B explosive was about 300,000 atmospheres, but because the explosion is being converged into a point, this amplifies the pressure. And uh, back of the envelope math suggests that right at the core, it was reaching something like six million atmospheres of pressure. That's almost twice the pressure of the core of the Earth. This is sufficient to compress the plutonium pit down to about twice its maximum density at normal atmospheric pressure in about five microseconds. At the very center of the pit, there was a small cavity for the neutron generator. The fast insertion time of the implosion system helps avoid pre-detonation, but it also results in a very short window for maximal compression before the pit starts to rebound outwards. The gadget's neutron generator was called the Urchin, and it used concentric spheres of beryllium plated with gold shielding and then with grooves that contained polonium-210. Now, when beryllium is bombarded with radiation, with, uh, it uh, throws out neutrons, but alpha, the alpha radiation coming off of the plutonium-210 was easily blocked by the gold plating. However, during the implosion, the force of this would efficiently mix the polonium and the beryllium together, so those alpha particles would then start generating neutrons, hundreds of neutrons every microsecond, ensuring that the chain reaction starts very, very quickly at the correct time. The neutron generator is actually one part of the bomb with a limited shelf life. Polonium-240 has a half-life of about six months, so the gadget was designed so that the pit would be removed uh, and the neutron initiator inserted just before it was used. I've also seen sources suggesting that during storage the pit could be filled with cadmium wire to uh, improve safety as a cadmium would absorb excess neutrons. The gadget was tested successfully on July 16th, 1945. This was the Trinity test. It was the first nuclear bomb detonated and there's a great deal of interesting stories uh, from, the, from the test. You know, Oppenheimer, of course, reflecting on Hindu mythology and Feynman breaking with protocol and deciding he wanted to get a really good look at the explosion so he didn't use his goggles and instead looked through a truck windshield to protect him from the UV rays. The scientists had a betting pool set up trying to predict the yield and, of course, Fermi jokingly suggesting that it might uh, potentially incinerate the Earth by igniting the atmosphere in a self-sustaining fusion reaction. The final yield was about 20 kilotons, and this is of course again with one-tenth of the fissile material of the Little Boy bomb. So the gadget represented a huge step up in weapons efficiency. The yield was actually twice what the scientists had expected, and some of the experiments were destroyed before they were able to yield useful data. Anyway, in the next part, I hope to talk about how this basic plutonium implosion design was further optimized over subsequent years to improve efficiency, get more yield, and of course, make bigger weapons. Until then, I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.